All right, good evening, everyone. Can you hear me if I speak without a mic? No. No? Okay, forget it. Forget that. Uh, okay, uh, my name is Gary Stern. I'm the uh, engagement editor for LOA.com and the Journal News. This is my colleague, Nancy Cutler. Thanks for coming tonight. We did not anticipate such a big crowd. Maybe we should have. Uh, we thought this was going to be a great room. I wish there was a seat for everybody. I'm sorry that there isn't. Um, uh, we're here. Not where you're going to be. Okay, so we're, we're here tonight uh, to talk about an issue uh, on which people tend to have strong, clear feelings. That should someone who is ill and presumably near death, someone who may be suffering and facing terrible pain, be allowed to obtain pharmaceuticals from a doctor to end their life sooner. It's, now, it's, it's a debate that calls into question the very meaning of suffering and the meaning of unbearable pain and even what it means to be terminally ill. There is even great disagreement about whether the word suicide, as in physician-assisted suicide, should be used to describe what we're talking about tonight. This will all come up. Now, whether someone should be legally allowed to seek uh, aid in dying or to provide such aid is not a new question, but it's being debated, as everyone here knows, I'm guessing, with increased intensity internationally and across the U.S. Um, last, last year, the, uh, the Supreme Court of Canada overturned a law that uh, resisted aid in dying. And just two weeks ago, I'm sure you saw that the new Canadian Prime Minister introduced legislation that would make it legal for a patient or a doctor to administer a lethal dose of medication. So in the U.S., four states, Oregon, Vermont, Washington, and California, have laws that permit aid in dying. In Montana, the state Supreme Court has ruled that the doctor, if charged with assisting a patient's death, can use the patient's prior request as a defense. But I've learned that people on different sides of this issue interpret that decision very differently. Um, several other states across the U.S. are also considering aid and dying laws. So now Nancy's going to say something about what's on the table in New York right now. So in New York, uh, the main bill driving the discussion about whether New York should have aid and dying um, as a law was authored by Assemblywoman Amy Pollan, um, who is with us tonight. Briefly, the bill would allow an adult of sound mind who is believed to have six months or less to live to make a written request to a primary care physician for a lethal dose of medication that the patient would self-administer. The patient Signing of this request would not would have to be witnessed by at least two people, one of whom could not be a relative or someone with a financial interest. The attending doctor would be responsible for determining that the patient has the mental capacity to make this choice and is doing so voluntarily. The doctor must determine that the patient is not suffering from a psychiatric or psychological disorder that would impair his or her judgment. If things go as planned, a death certificate would list the cause of death as the underlying terminal illness and not as a suicide. So tonight's debate will focus on the legislation and of course on the larger issues raised by the legislation. Now we know that people have very strong feelings about this issue and may have vehement objections to the arguments promoted by the other side. And that's fine, but we expect to have a respectful dialogue Please, no calling out. Let the panelists finish their thoughts. And the plan is, if we could wrap things up in about an hour, we'll, we'll deal with some questions from the audience. We'd like to do that. I don't know how many we'll get to, but we're going to give it our best shot. Uh, thanks to the Scarsdale Public Library for hosting us. And now Nancy's going to briefly introduce the panelists, and we will begin. I also want to remind people that the Journal News and LOHUD on its opinion um, pages and on the section of LOHUD publishes letters to the editor about all issues, including this one. So after tonight, if you want to write something for the Journal News, I'm sure we'll get a lot of feedback. The email address is letters at lohud.com, letters, plural, at lohud.com. 
So I want to briefly introduce our participants for the legislation and ADI in general. We have Assemblywoman Pollen, who re represents the 88th District. The Democrat has been on the Assembly since 2001. We have David Levin, Executive Director of End of Life Choices New York, a group working to expand end of life options. The group initiated a lawsuit in New York State Court to establish aid in dying as a right under current law or under the New York State Constitution. Stacy Gibson is a volunteer advocate for Compassion and Choices, a national group also working to expand end of life choices. She wrote a column for us about her own experience and she'll talk to me about that in a little while. Against the legislation and aid in dying in general are Anna Fay, who is a board member of Westchester Disabled on the Move and Vice President of Independent Living Services in New York City. Edward Neckman, Director of Public Policy for the Catholic Archdiocese of New York. He also oversees child protection programs for the Archdiocese and during the 1980s and early 1990s. He was an assistant DA and an assistant U.S. attorney. And J.J. Hansen, President of Patients Rights Action Fund, a national group fighting efforts to legalize what they can consider assisted suicide. He is a former aide to Governor Spitzer and Patterson and has a very interesting story that we'll have him tell as well. Okay, so as a way to get going, I'd like to ask uh, each panelist to briefly explain why they're here tonight. Uh, why is this issue important to you? We could start at one end and go across, or you could just take it as you feel comfortable. How do you want to, where do you want to start, JJ? I think we'll, uh, we'll go ahead and start with me. My name is JJ Hansen. I am the president of the Patients' Rights Action Fund. Um, as you mentioned, I have a unique story of why I'm here and what got me involved in this particular issue. Uh, I'm fairly passionate about this issue, and, and as the president of the Patients' Rights Action Fund, we're a national organization. We go state to state um, and work with various coalitions and alliances to fight against the legalization of assisted suicide. Uh, I'm originally from here, from New York, native New Yorker, uh, former Marine Corps officer, and then as you heard before, I worked for two New York State governors. So what got me involved in this particular issue? To me, if you asked me three years ago if I would get involved in assisted suicide, I would say probably not the issue that I would choose to be involved in. Uh, I was diagnosed in May of 2014 with terminal brain cancer, rare form of brain cancer called GBM, grade four glioblastoma multiform. And with that diagnosis, I was given a uh, prognosis of four months left to live. That's what I was told. I was not only told this once, but I was told it on multiple occasions where there was nothing I could do about my GBM, that it was going to die about it. Now, as of Friday, I officially uh, was told, I had an MRI on Friday, that I will make it past my two-year mark, and I have no sign of any cancer within my brain. So, I don't tell you this to say that I am, I am special or unique or anything like that, but it was something that, that brought me into this issue. Because I understood one of the critical flaws of this issue is that doctors are not always correct. They are human beings. They make mistakes. And approximately, they make mistakes 15% of the time, where they give a patient an incorrect diagnosis or an incorrect prognosis. That is significant, especially when you start talking about a patient who's at potentially at the end of life. And they're in a circumstance where that prognosis, that diagnosis can take, take away a very important and vital part of their survival. And that's the idea of hope. I've met with many, many patients, many other people, who were told that they were at the end of life. And in fact, in reality, they made it well past that, that initial prognosis. So as I got more involved, I learned a lot of the other details, and you'll hear more uh, about that tonight. I know I believe I only had two minutes, so I won't take up too much of time with the, the other speakers here. But I uh, look forward to, to being here to speak to you. And I ask for one thing. For those of you who have not set a position on this issue yet, a lot of you are here on one side or the other, but some of you are here to just listen. I don't expect to persuade you, per se. I expect for you to ask the questions when you leave here. Go out and do your own research. Go out and research this issue, learn more about it. That's my request for you. Thank you.
Good evening, everyone. My name is Ed Meckman. I'm the Public Policy Director at the Archdiocese of New York. I'm an attorney, <coughs> and I'm here because I think it's vitally important that when we start considering issues like this, issues of life and death, that we look at the details, that we look actually deep into these bills and see what they will actually do, what they will actually lead to, what the likely consequences long term might be, and in particular putting it in the big picture, looking at the overall social good and not just looking at individual cases. And I think that way, if you do your research and if you look at what is actually deep inside these bills, you will see that they are very dangerous. They do not protect patients. In fact, they expose patients to even greater dangers than they ordinarily face when they're near the end of life. They have uh, provisions that would be dangerous to vulnerable people, isolated people, people who don't have good health care already, people who don't know how to maneuver or manipulate through the system, people who might be subject easily to coercion or duress or pressure from family or others, and in particular, people who are suffering from mental illnesses, especially depression. <coughs> you also have to look at the bills and understand that there is no way ultimately in the long run to limit this kind of process, this kind of thing, to just people who are terminally ill with six months left to live. This is not a scare tactic argument. This is current events. All we have to do is look at what's happening in Belgium, in Holland, in Switzerland, and now in Canada. You can't limit it. It will inevitably stretch beyond the limits that are in this bill now to include people who are not terminally ill, people who are just suffering from psychological illnesses, and even ultimately to minors and people who have never asked <coughs> for suicide or euthanasia. There are no limiting principles. There are also, I think, a distressing lack of transparency in, in these bills. We will never know what is really happening out there. There is no mandatory reporting. There is no mandatory oversight. We will have no idea what happens to the patients and those pills once they leave the doctor's office. Uh, the false statement on the death certificate will forever hide how many cases actually happen. So this is something that is a very dangerous road to go down, especially when we start talking about suicide. Suicide is the tenth leading cause of death in the United States already. And we spend millions and millions of dollars trying to prevent suicide among teens and other groups. And this will send exactly the contrary message, namely that some people's lives are not worth living, and you might as well just check out. We are very, very concerned about this because this is a road that once you go down, there is no turning back. And on a matter of life and death, it is vitally important that we move beyond the slogans, beyond the newspaper stories, beyond the hard-tugging instances, and really, really look carefully at the details. Thank you. My reason for being here tonight is uh, very much connected to the fact that I am a disability rights activist and have been for a number of decades. Um, this position has been held historically by the organized uh, disability community. And the reason for that is hard to understand. I'm going to try to explain it tonight, and this is why I'm here. Um, it, people with disabilities are by and large devalued in our society. Um, what I mean by that is that it's very difficult when you look at the medical community to, in general, to get the kind of care that we need just to be healthy uh, the same way everybody else is. We're not, our lives are not valued. There are many myths about our lives. Um, for example, the bill talks about the loss of autonomy and dependency. Um, pain is actually, believe it or not, uh, looking at some of the uh, Oregon statistics today, Pain is the, one of the last things on the list that people uh, have concerns about who have requested the medication in, in Oregon. So the pain is not the biggest issue. It's the loss of things that they, everybody felt, or that they felt uh, that they enjoyed, and they were no longer going to be able to enjoy. 
But that includes, if you think about it, and think about people with disabilities, loss of autonomy, what do you think about? Um, being loss of body functions, what do, you, what do you think about? There are people who are living lives today, very productive lives, and really very, very good lives, and have joy in their lives, uh, are working, are maybe not working, maybe just having fun with their pets, whatever it is, who have all of those things. And they are not terminally ill, and they're not asking for pills uh, to end their lives earlier than it would ordinarily end. I'm going to, I don't do this, but I'm going to do it here tonight because I feel this issue is very important. I also have a very personal reason for being here. My husband had multiple sclerosis and lived at home on a ventilator with a tray for 10 years at home. Can I tell you what the worst part of that ordeal was? Fighting for the services he needed to do that. <laughs> not the pain, not the loss of autonomy, not the bodily function part. No, that was not. We had joy. We had a family. We had support. But that worst part of that was fighting for, for what he needed. So <clears throat> I'm here tonight. Um, I hope that you will understand why I'm here tonight and after having said this. <coughs> Good evening. Thank you very much for the opportunity to be here and to be on this most impressive and diverse panel. Um, I speak to you this evening as a strong supporter of Asian dying for all New Yorkers and as a volunteer for Compassionate Choices. Um, my purpose tonight to be here is very simple. It's to put a voice uh, and a human face on this very important issue. And it's to talk and tell the story of my husband, Sid, and my very best friend. My husband, Sid, was a really smart, successful man who really relished life. But it was not meant to be. In May of 2014, a rare progressive motor neuron disease called spinocerebellar ataxia took his life at the age of 68 after an eight-year battle. If you looked at Sid, you probably thought that he had ALS, what we all sort of know as Lou Gehrig's disease. The disease caused Sid's body to slowly weaken and atrophy over an eight-year period of time, starting in his toes and eventually working up to his shoulders. Yet his mind remained sharp until the day he died. For some terminally ill patients like my husband, there are no medical options. There were no pills for him, no surgery, no radiation, no clinical trials for him to enter. The only thing that waited him over an eight year period was to slowly lose every part of his body and to wait for the inevitable. He fought against it, but the, the end actually came. And he suffered at the end, and it wasn't pretty. It wasn't the death that he wanted, and it wasn't the death that he deserved. What he wanted was the option for aid and dying. I can't sit here and tell you that he would have actually exercised that option, because I don't know if he would have. I don't know if anybody can tell you what they would do until they're ultimately faced with that ultimate prognosis. Nobody knows until we actually get there. What I do know is that he would have wanted that option because it would have provided him tremendous comfort at the end. And it would have allowed him to actually um, fulfill his final days and live them to the absolute fullest, which he did not was able to do. I strongly believe that all terminally ill New Yorkers, like my husband Sid, deserve the chance to make their own end-of-life health care decisions on their own. Again, I'm very delighted to be here with this very wonderful panel. And I really want to thank uh, the Journal News for hosting this very, very important discussion. Thank you. Aid in dying is about the very important right that I've been fighting for for the last 14 years. I've studied this issue very carefully, and I know 
that much of what's been said by our opponents is just not factually true. There has been a law in Oregon for 18 years which has been extraordinarily successful by any measure. There has been a law in Washington now for the past seven years also extremely successful which allows only people who are terminally ill, mentally competent, and adult people who are close to dying to be able to take prescribed medicines after two doctors have determined that the patient is terminally ill and likely to die within six months. This isn't about diagnoses and prognoses generally, as J.J. Hansen said. This is about people who are close to dying. Ninety percent of people who actually take the medications are in hospice. They are getting the best possible care. Yet suffering goes on because we cannot control all suffering. And the question is, who's going to make the decision at the end of our lives as to how we die? Is it going to be you as an individual, or is it going to be the government which says, no, you cannot end your lives this way? We all have a right at the very end of our lives to end our suffering by having life-sustaining treatment withdrawn, whether it's a ventilator or a feeding tube, or we can stop dialysis or stop a cardiac device. We can stop eating and drinking. We can have palliative sedation if our pain becomes too severe where it can't be controlled. This is just another option which everybody should have the right to exercise and nobody has to exercise this option. Hardly anybody does. Only about three in 1,000 people actually take the medications in Oregon and Washington, those people who actually die in those states. The law has worked extraordinarily, extraordinarily well, and it's not suicide. When you think about suicides, those acts are committed by people who could continue to live. They are acts of desperation, almost always in isolation, without any discussion with others, and oftentimes they are done violently. It, they are tragic. Aid and dying is totally different. It's about a person who is very close to the end of their life, who consults with, a, with two doctors, with family members, and this, it's not done in isolation. It takes the, the uh, amount of time that it takes from the start of the process to the end is about seven weeks. So it's not done impulsively. It's not a violent end. And yet this goes on in all the other states where aid and dying is not legal, underground, unregulated. We should bring it above ground. We should have it regulated. And when people do take these medications, for them and their family members, it's an act of empowerment. Thank you. I'm Amy Pollan, and I am the assembly member who has authored the bill. Uh, when uh, Dave had come to me as one of my constituents and told me he was working on this issue, I had uh, thought, well, I really knew very little about it. I, at the time. I said, let me think about it. I'm open-minded. Um, I sponsor a lot of bills uh, in health. So I was intrigued. Uh, he was persuasive, and I started to do some research. Little did I know that a short time afterward, I would live the bill. My sister had been diagnosed with terminal cancer, fourth stage ovarian cancer, and she, um, we had uh, gone through the process of all of the operations and all of the, um, all of the medical technologies that, that can be used, chemo, et cetera, et cetera. And she was in remission for a while and then her cancer returned very much like it started uh, with her stomach being very bloated. And soon thereafter, uh, they inserted a feeding tube um, and other tubes and for a year she lived after remission she lived with these tubes coming out of her body with with an inability to eat uh, and she lived like that for a year and when she did she didn't want to see anybody including her sisters all four of us uh, she hid in her house she would she refused to um, have visitors, refused family members, refused uh, friends, uh, because the way she felt and the she 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 oh, she couldn't stand without she couldn't stand without getting sick. 
uh, and she certainly um, uh, was very unhappy in the way she looked, and she really hid. Uh, and uh, so, shortly thereafter, after a year of living like this, her physician said to her, you're not getting better. You're not getting better. You're not going to get better. Uh, you have some choices. You can either continue, and you'll see how long you can maintain living like you are now, or you can go into hospice, you can go into hospice and withdraw food, you can withdraw, withdraw meds, you can withdraw liquids, you can do whatever you want to do under the law. Well, my sister had decided she had no longer any quality of life and she admitted into hospice and she decided meds and food were, she, she couldn't eat anyway, but so she wouldn't get liquid food. And then we waited for her to die. And she waited for her to die. I cannot tell you how many times she would say, uh, when am I going to die already? And in between, she would pump that morphine button. And she'd pump the morphine button, and she'd go into a coma, and then she'd come out to be in excruciating pain just to pump it again. And she, this went on and on and on. And being that she lives in Georgia, I would go down and visit. But I wasn't there when she died, and when I'd leave, she cried. When my other sisters would leave, she would cry. She wanted us to be there. We couldn't be there all the time. Family members slept next to her because they knew that if she was going to go, somebody wanted to be there when she went. That's not the way she wanted to die. Now, again, just like your husband, I don't know whether my sister would have taken a pill. I can only tell you that that she wanted to die with all of us there. She wanted to get rid of the pain. There was no uh, misdiagnosis. You know, this woman was, was, uh, was lying there without any hope and any prayer left. So, uh, so I now feel passionate about the bill that I had agreed to carry first intellectually and now with my heart and soul. I believe that this is a viable, important option for people, uh, that it's no different. Uh, in fact, it's kinder than palliative care is. Uh, it is a nicer, gentler way for people to die who are going to die anyway. And I would only say that, you know, I understand that the bill has been amended a few but the current version, and I would argue none of the versions, included provisions that, would, that wouldn't allow documentation. In fact, documentation is required, um, as it's required in Oregon, is reported every year. I have the latest one if anyone wants to take a look. Uh, this is carefully monitored by the health department. Uh, the only reason that the death certificate uh, does not say suicide is because it's not suicide. It's an end-of-life care. Uh, it's an end-of-life option just like the others that are already allowed by law. So I look forward to more questions. Thank you for coming tonight. Thank you, Ms. Jones, for having me. I just want to um, thank the panelists. And um, we have a lot of questions. So we're, we're understand it's very hard to seek brevity on such an important topic, but that's what we're going for. Um, but for, I had this, here's a, a question, let's see who wants to answer first, I'm sure you all want to weigh in. Some hospice groups, including the American Hospice Foundation, see aid in dying as the antithesis of their movement, and maybe as a competition. Our medical system is notoriously bad at end of life planning and support, and hospice is considered underused and misunderstood. Should we focus first on good deaths before hasten deaths? David. Yeah. Um, as I mentioned earlier, 90% of people in Oregon are actually in hospice. I understand why some hospices might be in opposition. However, the former executive director of the Oregon Hospice Association, who served in that position for 18 years, actually recently changed her position from one of opposition to one of support. And she wrote an article that was published in the Sacramento Bee uh, just, last in, just this past year. And what she essentially said was 
that at first I was opposed to this, to aid and die. I opposed the bill in Oregon. But now I've seen that we can't control all suffering. And because we can't control all suffering, people should have options available to end their lives as they see fit in accordance with their own values and wishes. I was arrogant to take the position that I took in opposition because I know that hospice cannot do everything for every person. Yes, most people who die in hospice have relatively good deaths, but not everyone in hospice does. And so, the former executive director of the Oregon Hospice Association, Ann Jackson, has come around and changed her position. In addition to that, the American Public Health Association, the American Medical Women's Association, the American Medical Students Association, the American College of Legal Medicine have all taken the position in support of aid and dying, and each one of those organizations rejects assisted suicide terminology because they do not believe that this constitutes a suicide. Okay, let's just go to the other side and then we'll come back. I'll, I'll weigh in first on, uh, on hospice. New York State is one of the worst states in the nation in terms of use of hospice. And I think we have to be careful about when we use the term hospice uh, as a substitute for good end-of-life care. Uh, good end-of-life care involves dealing with the entire person, all of the elements of their suffering. It's not just physical suffering. That can be dealt with with medicine. Ask any palliative care physician. Dr. Brescia, who is the lead doctor at Calvary Hospital, has said repeatedly that virtually every case, the pain can be managed so that the patient is comforted. A lot of the suffering that happens is emotional, it's psychological, it's social in terms of the family, and other things like that. We need to enhance the access to hospice. We need to work to stop the insurance companies from cutting people off from good uh, end-of-life care. Uh, and we can't just use the term hospice as the equivalent of all end-of-life care. Uh, this is a, a, a family illness when a person's near the end of life. It's a community illness. Uh, and we all need to pitch in uh, for that as well. Um, I appreciate that, uh, uh, that David gave a list of the organizations that, uh, that are in favor of this. The New York Hospice Association is against it. So is the New York Medical Society. So is the American Medical Association. So, you know, if we want to talk trading uh, uh, endorsements, uh, you can do the research, you can find out. Uh, but in particular, I would say, ask the disabilities activists. How many of them are in favor of assisted suicide? Because they're the ones who really know what's going to happen. I actually just wanted to second what, um, uh, what was just said. Our, our hospice program here in New York um, is, is probably one of, one of the least uh, utilized in the nation. There are 28% of uh, Medicare enrollees dying on hospice in New York as compared to 44% nationally. So we're, we have a long way to go to, uh, to fund and to, to improve our hospice services. Uh, so obviously the answer to your question for me is um, we, need, we need to do something about hospice before we look to uh, aid and dying. Yeah, I'd like to just, A, I'd like to make a plug for hospice. Uh, my husband was in hospice and I have to say um, he got su really supportive care and superb care through Putnam um, County Hospice. But I think the bigger issue here is, um, and from some of the research I read about aid and dying, is that it does help. One of the issues that we don't tackle enough in our society are the conversations that have to happen before we get to this issue. And what are we doing to prepare people for death? And are we having the conversations with our families about what are their wishes until we get to this issue? And some of the laws, some of the research that um, in states that have aid and dying, Huh, sorry. Hi, sorry. Some of the research about states that have aid and dying legislation, and David, you can talk about this a little bit better than I can, is that it has helped families talk ahead of time about what their wishes are and helps prepare families ahead of time so that when the crisis does happen, the families are much better prepared. But the other thing I will say about hospice is, is that hospice supports aid and dying right now through a process called VSED, which is voluntarily stopping eating and drinking 
which is what my husband did. And I will tell you that they're saying that this is a, a humane way to go. It may be for some. I have to tell you, it was horrific for my husband, and it is not a painless, and it is not a painful, a humane way to go. And I will argue that Aiden dying through, through prescription medication and through a legal process like what is being offered through uh, Representative Pollan is far more humane and far more dignified than what V said will allow people to do. So I would ask you all to think about that. States that have Aiden dying laws, most people who obtain the medications never use them. I'd like to ask the panelists if this is an argument for or against having Aiden dying laws. First of all, you're equal time. Oh, no problem. Um, I think that's, a, that's an interesting question uh, when you look at how many people actually use them and how many people actually don't use them. To make the argument that this is supportive of assisted suicide, I actually don't think is fairly accurate. In many of the cases where people don't use the assisted suicide drugs, it's because they're actually doing fairly well. Again, this goes back to the issue that I talked about earlier in the fact that you have many cases where people are giving a prognosis or a diagnosis that's incorrect. It's not accurately correct, so people continue on. And it also shows the fact that you don't need to have assisted suicide pills to die peacefully or with dignity. The idea that you have to have these pills or somehow you're undignified is actually insulting to many people who die naturally or go through palliative care. To say somehow that one thing works for everyone is not accurate. It's completely inaccurate. Another thing I want to just point to that's been said several times by some of the proponents of this, uh, our other panelists, is that this is being reported well. <coughs> Absolutely not true. It is not being reported well. And the legislation, with all due respect, does not require that it's reported well. If you ask me if I, and this is coming from a former, former person of an administration that's working in government operations, if I trust the health department of New York State to make sure that this is going to be properly controlled, absolutely not. <laughs> Well, first, um, to the question, the, um, since the law was passed in 1997, there were a total, there is a total of 1,545 people who had prescriptions, and 991 died from ingesting the medications. So that average, I think it comes to 64% of people who actually get the prescriptions take, uh, the, take the medication. Uh, the, the number that I think that you, you were reciting and what we hear all the time is that of the number of deaths in Oregon, it's a very small number. It was point, uh, point 0.18, less than 2% of the deaths in Oregon came from uh, this medication. That's, the, that's really, so the numbers are just getting a little confused. It's actually uh, uh, a higher number than, uh, than is reported of actual people who use the medication. Although, um, and I would, um, I would, having worked very closely with the health department, I have the greatest deal of respect, and I don't, I don't think that, um, firstly, if you look at the Oregon report, it's extraordinarily comprehensive. Uh, that would be of the same intent in New York to do the same exact thing. Every single case is followed up. If a doctor doesn't report, he's held responsible for not reporting. Uh, that instance. So there, you know, just to merely say, oh, we think that the state agency isn't going to do a good job, uh, and therefore we should deny people this option, is is absurd on its face. Uh, and that's not the reason why we should be denying people this compassionate, compassionate way of dying. And I would just add uh, uh, that my sister too suffered. Uh, at the end by, by withdrawing food and withdrawing uh, uh, medication. It was not a pleasant death, and it took three weeks to die um, in, in that way. Uh, three weeks of complete agony. So it, that, in my mind, in, in, in her mind, in every family member's mind, palliative care was not a compassionate choice like this would be. I'd just like to add two points about the idea of people going home with the medicine and then uh, we don't know what's going to happen to them. 
There's no requirement in this bill that anybody account for anything that happens after the patient leaves the doctor's office. We have no idea where those pills are going to go. We're talking about large doses of pentobarbital being one of the most common pills, which is highly uh, addictive, which is a drug of abuse. And I imagine here in Scarsdale, just like in Yonkers where I live, there's a very significant problem with the abuse of prescription drugs. My son is addicted to drugs partly because of the abuse of prescription drugs. We have no idea who's going to be with the patient when they take the drugs. We have no idea what their mental state will be when they take the drugs. We have no idea if they're being coerced when they're taking the drugs. We have no idea if they're even doing it themselves. So this is a major problem here. Again, we're abandoning the patient to who knows what when they walk out of the, the, uh, the doctor's office. And as far as reporting requirements, uh, you know, with all respect, assembly member, uh, I'd refer you to section 29, uh, 2899-0 of your, your bill, where it talks about how the commissioner, that's commissioner of health, shall annually review a sample of the records. We have no idea what that sample will be, because there's no requirement that anybody report. The department may adopt regulations establishing reporting requirements. It may. That's not mandatory, right? May is permissive. In Oregon, there is no mandatory reporting. It is permissive. It is voluntary. And the uh, Oregon Department of Human Services will even admit that they have no idea what is going on out there except for the people who voluntarily report. Uh, if there's no penalty to not reporting, I mean, how many of us would file our tax returns? <laughs> I have a few comments on what Penny just said. Just as we don't know what's happening when people get the medications in their home, we also don't know what's happening with all the morphine that is in people's homes who are in a hospice. It's exactly the same situation. There is no requirement that, uh, or no regulation, no safeguards there. The same is true. Uh, when it comes to, there are, we have a lot of safeguards and regulations and requirements in this bill. But think about when a person makes a decision to end life-sustaining treatment, have a ventilator withdrawn, stop dialysis, have a cardiac device stop, voluntarily stop eating and drinking. There are no statutory requirements or safeguards. So there are always going to be complaints about the fact that there aren't enough safeguards, there are not enough requirements, reporting or otherwise. This, again, is about your right as a terminally ill, suffering patient to decide how you are going to die in accordance with your values and wishes. It's not about people with disabilities. It's only about people who are terminally ill and who are dying. You have to be terminally ill and dying in order to be able to get a prescription of medication which you can decide to take. And the fact that one-third of people never take the medications seems to point to the fact that people are making rational, considered decisions and have changed their minds as everyone has an absolute right to do. No one's, there is no evidence whatsoever in Oregon of coercion or exploitation. And that was just mentioned in, in a, and that was just mentioned in a New York Times editorial yesterday. And and in the New York Times yesterday's editorial, yes, they said that there's no evidence at all of exploitation or coercion, something to that effect. Now I want to just read very briefly from a letter which uh, was written just in uh, February of this year from the executive director of the Oregon Disability Rights, uh, Disability Rights Oregon. What he says is DRO, meaning Disability Rights Oregon, has still not received a complaint of exploitation or coercion of an individual with disabilities in the use of Oregon's Death with Dignity Act. That's over 18 years, not one complaint. So there is fear mongering, there are statements being made and assertions that are being made which simply are not true. This these are facts. Add also that um, uh, a terminal illness is also defined in this bill uh, as being irrespective of treatment. Irrespective of treatment. So somebody can be terminally ill by and, and have diabetes in, as, oh, and not, just not be treated. 
Or somebody can be turned. Can be, that's what the bill says. Is my wrong on that one? You can. It's irrespective of treatment. It's irrespective of treatment. We should we should worry about that. Okay, um, there, there are lots of concerns about coercion that started to come up, but also, when people are terminally ill, they often worry not only about themselves, but about the impact of their illness on family and loved ones. Might people choose to end their lives early to relieve stress on their loved ones, and does this matter? This is a, a, a very interesting question on this particular legislation, on the issue in general. The, the issue of depression, of stress, of what you're going to be going through, the argument of those who support the bill are going to say, well, in the beginning, you can be reviewed. Not that you must be reviewed, but you can be reviewed. You can be sent uh, to a psychologist or a psychiatrist to have you take a look and see if you are going through depression. How many people does this actually happen to in Oregon? Maybe three, four? since it's been in place, where you have doctors over there who are reporting that approximately 25% of those who are going through and receiving the pills are actually in a state of depression when they receive it. That's scary, because it's obviously not being done. So now let's add to this problem. Let's add to this problem. So in my particular case, I received a terminal diagnosis. Terminal diagnosis, I was given four months left to live. If this were legal, I would be qualified to receive those drugs. When I received that diagnosis, I was not depressed. I was in a good mental state. I could have received those pills. In month five, when I was going through the worst of my treatment, I was depressed. I was in pain. And the question did come to my mind, is this worth fighting? Now, I don't believe that I probably would have taken those pills at the time, but there are many people who in that position, who are going through difficult pain, who are not emotionally able to make that decision for themselves, who would go that route? And they would take those pills. And that is ending their life well early of when they should have. And they could survive. They could last years. In my case, 15 months later, I'm doing fine. That is the scary part of this legislation. There's no oversight for that person once they receive those pills. Nobody's checking in on them. No one from the health department is going to be there knocking at your door saying, hey, we want to make sure you're doing okay, that you're not depressed this week. No. You go home, the door closes, you're on your own. I think it's important to think about this option as, as a medical care option, just like other medical care options. Right. If you do, If you do, you would, you would realize that under this option, it requires, under the revised bill, it's requiring two physicians. It's requiring those physicians to determine that someone is terminally ill, and it was completely misquoted. I want to read the definition in, in the bill because it took eight of us. There were a lot of emails to get these words right. Um, uh, and the terminal illness means an illness that will, within reasonable medical judgment, result in death within six months, whether or not treatment is provided. What that means is, whether or not you get chemo or you don't get chemo, 80% 80 80 of the patients in Oregon, by the way, had cancer. So whether you get chemo or not, you're going to die anyway within a reasonable medical judgment. Two doctors, reasonable medical judgment. You have to have capacity. Um, both of those doctors are going to say, is this person able to make a decision? If they think they can't, they refer them to a psychologist or a psychiatrist to help them make that decision. So when we talk about other medical treatments, palliative care, my sister. My sister was told by one physician that chemo's not helping you and you're going to die anyway. She didn't get a second check from another doctor. Her capacity wasn't evaluated. And she chose to go into hospice and die within three weeks. This bill has more safeguards for this option than any other medical option that we have ever had. 
uh, in New York or anywhere else. And, and I respect that, they, that we, um, as a society, feel that we need this. I get that. But remember, it is the same thing as in the case of your husband and my sister being terminally ill and deciding that it was time to die. The method is different. And that method is requiring incredible safeguards. The 15, 20 pages of safeguards. And we can, if you want, we can name all of them. But they are safeguard after safeguard to be sure that the right decision is being made for that patient and, and, and that, frankly, that the medical care that they receive is the finest. And as far as the drugs being out there, we also have the provision. And this provision is not under palliative care, where there's morphine um, and other types of drugs. But there is another provision in the bill, sorry, glasses, um, uh, that essentially says safe disposal of unused medications. The department shall make regulations providing for the safe disposal of unused med medications prescribed, dispensed, or ordered under this article. So in other words, if any of these drugs are ordered by uh, any physician, there ha there's going to be regulations put in place as to what happens to them every step of the way. That's not true. Uh, in other types of medical care where you use all of the types of drugs that we do fear that our children will get. But not here. Here we put that safeguard right into the bill. So you, you want to name another one? We have it in here uh, and we can address it. Thank you. And one of, the, one of them relates to safeguards. Um, as a person with a disability, I don't trust that doctors know everything, okay? I, and I, I'm not saying that they're not knowledgeable about their particular specialties, but they come to their work, the same as all of us do, with attitudes and, and beliefs and myths and, and all, kinds of, um, all kinds of things that, emotions that, um, you know, that, that the rest of us have. They are making decisions, not just based on an x-ray, they're making decisions based on what they believe. And if they believe that not having control over your bladder and bowel is worse than death, then they're going to think you should get the medication. What I'm saying to you is that these you cannot safeguard against attitudes. And this this is not so that's uh, that's it. <laughs> need to make a point about patients who don't have cancer, who have rare diseases like my husband, where doctors, I agree with you JJ, doctors do make mistakes. And doctors don't know everything, they're human beings like everybody else. But there are patients like my husband who was told, for, for years and years I dragged him from doctor to doctor, from MRI to MRI. They couldn't figure out what was wrong with him, they couldn't not get a diagnosis and he just continued to get weaker and weaker until we finally did get a diagnosis. And there was no medication, and there was no, no cure, and there was nothing that he could do. And he did not accept that, and he kept fighting back, and he did everything in his power to fight against the ultimate weakness. He went to trainers every day. He worked out for three hours a day in the gym. He did everything to keep his body strong. It kept getting weaker until he couldn't work out anymore. He researched on, on the internet to find healthy foods until the dysphagia in his lungs and his, and his entire body got so bad that he couldn't swallow food anymore unless I pulverized it and thickened his liquids because he couldn't swallow without it getting diverted into his lungs and then he would gag and he didn't have a gag reflux anymore. He did everything possible to stay healthy until the end. And after seven years of fighting and getting nothing but weaker, he finally looked at me and said, I am not ready to die, but I am just too tired to live anymore. And you get to a point where there is just nothing left. And it's at that point where somebody needs an option to get away from their insufferable, their insufferable suffering and their just inability to go on anymore. And this is not about disability. This is about his body had just stopped working and his body had completely failed him. And he was, he was dying. 
it was not suicide anymore. He was not talking about suicide. He was talking about ending his pain and his suffering. This is why the law is important for cases like that. Thank you. You know, when we make law, we make it based on individual cases, but we really make law for the common good, for the best of interest of everybody alive now and people who are coming along in the future. If, if bills like this are passed, does anybody really think that palliative care is going to get any better? Does anybody think that the doctors are going to do any more research into finding new cures or rare things like changes? Really? Do you really? Do you really think? Do you really think that the insurance companies won't have something to say here about the less, uh, the less costly alternative? Do you really? Do you really think that in the medical profession? Excuse me. You are slandering the medical profession. Does anybody really think that in a state where there is terrible? Does anybody really think that in a state that already is is hit very hard by disparities in health care between, between the different kinds of communities that we have, inner city communities, rural communities. Does anybody think, really think that, that offering uh, a quick, easy, cheap way out is going to, is going to make medicine better? Uh, no, of course not. The, the insurance, our insurance, our, our medical industry is already cost-driven. We already know, everybody here must know, a case where doctors won't even tell you about an option because the insurance companies won't cover it. Or you'll be sent out of the hospital before you're well because the insurance companies won't cover it. If the insurance company knows that a couple hundred bucks worth of drugs is going to take care of the problem, uh, what do you think they're going to do if the cost of your care is going to be over $4,000 a month? Uh, I don't think the answer is that hard to say. <laughs> Everything that Ed just said was wrong. Everything. Oh. Oh. In, in Oregon, we have 18 years of experience, and Oregon has is, is always rated as one of the top states when it comes to the provision of palliative care. Palliative care has increased dramatically in Oregon since the Oregon Death with Dignity New Law was passed. There is no there is no connection between this aid and dying and palliative care and hospice care. We know that from experience in Oregon and Washington. There is no reason to expect it would be any different than New York. Ed is simply wrong. We talked, we've talked a little bit about uh, how doctors will be regulated. And I wanted to bring up kind of a, a parallel I was thinking about with New York's medical marijuana law. Many doctors don't want to be involved. There are, it's very hard to find a doctor to prescribe, in part because the federal government does not recognize medical marijuana, and that brings up all kinds of legal concerns. This New York aid and dying legislation is structured so a prescribing doctor would not face civil or criminal charges. But could we see doctors not wanting to be officially involved over similar concerns? We talked about, I mean, can, can some of you talk about what you, what, how a doctor would truly be protected when the federal law is not a mirror law? The bill is, we have uh, what we're calling a conscience clause, uh, where any medical facility uh, and, and or any physician who doesn't want to do this, doesn't have to, would not be asked to do it, would cannot be penalized because they've chosen not to do it. Uh, and, and you're right, there are some doctors uh, in various states that have this law who have decided that they don't want to participate. And over time, an increasing number have, uh, but certainly there's no requirement, and we go out of our way in the bill to ensure that any medical professional that doesn't want to do it, doesn't have to, and cannot be penalized because of it. Actually, uh, when, you, when you read the bill in connection with the Palliative Care Information Act, which is already uh, in law, uh, doctors must inform patients of all uh, available end-of-life options. If a, no, if that's not correct. The bill does not say that. That's that's the bill. What the bill says. 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 What the bill says.
Let him speak. I'll read the bill. Let's continue. Go ahead. I'm sorry. The Palliative Care Information Act requires that doctors uh, inform the patients of all available end-of-life options. That's what the law says. If the if uh, aid in dying or assisted suicide becomes one of those options, doctors will be required under the law to either inform the patient or refer them to someone who will. So yes, uh, physicians will be required to be involved in this, either directly or by cooperation, by sending them off to another doctor. Think of how that would affect, for instance, Calvary Hospital, which is one of the leading Catholic cancer care hospitals in America. And our doctors would be required either to inform or refer people to do something that is a gross violation of our religious beliefs. I'm sorry, Ed, but once again, you are wrong. I initiated the Palliative Care Information Act in New York. I know what it says. And what it says is that a doctor or nurse practitioner, whoever the attending practitioner is, who makes a terminal diagnosis must offer to provide information and counseling to the patient on palliative care and end-of-life options appropriate to the patient, including uh, palliative care, pain management, and hospice. That's what the law says. That's what he said. No, he did not say it. He said, no, he said he'd have to, be, he'd have to go offer aid and die. That's not so. I said information. I said either information or... On all end-of-life options. It's not what the law says. It doesn't say all end-of-life options. End of, it says end-of-life options appropriate to the patient. Take a look at the law. I know what the law says. I initiated it myself. It, it, and it was passed in 2011. It went to effect on February 9th, 2011. All right, uh, if we could all, we could all calm down and also please stay on a singular issue. We're here to talk about assisted suicide. That's the singular issue we're here to talk about. Um, I would also ask you, sir. Also, sir, please stop screaming in the mic. I have a very bad ear due to my surgery, and it actually hurts my head. Thank you. Um, <laughs> funny statement, but it's, it's true. Uh, one of the things that you just brought up was the issue of medical marijuana. All right. That is an, a very controversial issue, and I don't plan on getting into it, because again, I'm focusing on one singular issue here, the issue of assisted suicide. But how is it related? Hold on. Hold on. Hold it whatever you want. The issue here is that when you look at other social issues that have come up to our society in the past few years, typically they affect one individual person. So you get into this, this ideology of where we are as a society and say, well, if, it, if it's okay for me, if it's my choice, if it's just good for me, who are you to tell me what, what to do? The problem with this legislation is it is not just you. It is other people. It affects those around you. Other people who suffer from GBM, we heard before, you said, how does that happen? How, how does that infect, uh, or impact you in terms of, of clinical trials? All right, that's the way that cancer, they, they research these developments of new cures, et cetera. Now, GBM, the type of cancer that I have, about 10 to 12,000 people get that per year. 70% of us will die within the first year. 90% will die within three years. So already, to try and get actual research done to find a cure to that disease is very difficult because those professionals who are looking for that research are competing against other cancers which are much larger, which might not be terminal, and likely they aren't terminal in those situations, and they're competing. So now add in where you, you take assisted suicide, it's legalized across the nation, which let's be realistic here, that's the end goal of the proponents of this legislation is to see it legalized everywhere. Get enough states, then we'll make it a, a federal judicial issue, we'll win, and it's legal, overnight, boom, done. Not your state choice anymore, it's the federal choice. So that happens. So now that small remaining factor where you could have actually done research to find a cure to this strange and rare disease, those people are being told, well actually, by their insurance companies, we're not gonna fund your treatment but we will fund these assisted suicide. And you can say, no, that it's not happening, but it's been reported twice in the state of Oregon. It's been reported twice in the state of Oregon that this is happening. And since it was reported, they've stopped actually sending those letters, and it's unreported. So when you have that happen, you have less people here to actually take part in this, these type of clinical research trials. When you have less people taking part, you get less financial resources. When you get less financial resources, those top level doctors that are going into these fields, Guess where they're going? Not to those rare types of cancer, because there's no money to fund their research. That is the trickle-down effect here. 
That is how it impacts other people's lives. So it's not just about an individual. It's not just about one person. It's not just about me, me, me. It's about society as a whole. And that's how it can impact other people. Pressure from family and friends to end the problems of prolonged suffering of all those involved. But won't this bill raise this to a new level as a mainstream option and set uh, an expectation for, in society? Yes, um, I think that it will, and it's been it's been pointed out that this there is no there is no way that we will. I work in healthcare, all right. So when when we're talking about any kind of funding of anything, it's it's a pretty difficult way to go, uh, and to think that we we've, we've got a long way to go with palliative care and hospice care. Offering any kind of a of an option to not fund these two programs, or it's just not going to happen. Um, we, it's not cost of you know the cost of end of life is the I believe it, it was and I believe it still is more cost than uh, you know than any at any other point in our lives. And so looking at how we can cut cost. Um, this is a this is a good way to do it, and you know it, it's it. I know, you know. Let me just say this, and, and it, because it's been going through my mind a lot. People have said to me, and I'm, I'm really what I'm reacting to. I think is is um, is Amy's actual. She keeps saying it's not about disability, and and I I think I know what you mean by that. But having worked. Um, on the task force for with us for a long time, I find that this disingenuous. I mean, this it is about disability. It is about what people see disability as, and, and the perspective of what that life is. That's what this is about. This is what people are asking for for uh, relief from. These are their concerns. It's in the, the Oregon um, report. Why people, what are their concerns at end of life? The end of life is what their concerns are what I pointed out before, not pain. So, you know, it, it is about disability and there is a slippery slope. Uh, let me tell you, <laughs> I, there is, we, we don't get the kind of, well, I'm not gonna go into that, we're, we're, we're talking about it. This is, this is your time. at this from a slightly different perspective. Um, I truly believe, having gone through the experience with my husband, that people have a basic desire to live and to live as long as they want. People don't want to die. They truly want to live at all costs. My husband, um, he, we were married for a very long time, almost 34 years, and when we, we always initially kidded, he said, I'll never let you do things for me such as help me shower, help me toilet, change my diaper. And that's what I did for him at the end. And he allowed me to do things that he always swore he would never ever let me do because he ultimately wanted to live as long as possible. So he allowed me to do those things because life was too precious for him. He wanted to see his granddaughter dance at her wedding. It never was gonna happen, okay? So I truly believe that people ultimately want to survive and want to live on this wonderful planet for as long as possible. So having this option is truly a last resort option for people. So, you know, hospice is one way to help people at the end, but it is an option to help when there is no other resort and people are just suffering too much at the end. So, yes, I hear you, Anna, about is it about disability? No, for me, it's not about disability. It's about ending suffering and pain. And it is about taking away that last bit of, I, I just have to end my suffering. So I will disagree with you a little bit on that. I don't disagree with you on that. I'm talking about two doctors and, and, and having the ability to 
decide whether I or any one of us yes. uh, is a sound mind, yes. is terminally ill, on and on and on. And the descriptions of people who are taking this medication or asking for it have no balance about what is a, what might be available to them. My husband, who actually was married to me and my friends, <laughs> and who are many of whom are disabled, and so when it came time for him to make the decision as to whether he wanted to live or not, he had pneumonia that could not be cured, not, could not be, it wasn't responding to medication, and so the only choice he had was to go to get a trach and to be on a ventilator for the rest of his life. Uh, when he made that choice to live, be on the ventilator, he had already known people who lived with traits on ventilators. And so to him, he knew that he could have a life. When somebody is in, uh, in, in a terminally ill, or, and they're, one, and they're, and they're, what they're thinking about and what their fears are and concerns are, and they have nothing, nothing whatsoever to counter those fears. So the pill is, is, a, is a real option for them, and the only one. My point is that we need to do a better job of, of treating people at the end of their lives and people's families um, in, in, a, in a much better way than we already do. We don't even have the conversations. We have another um, audience question. Uh, since we're short on time, we're trying to get to switching quickly to the audience questions. Um, this person asks, once the state condones what they call assisted suicide, what logical grounds does the state have to protect anyone from committing suicide? If suicide is a right for one, it is a right for all, how can you say that this bill cannot be a right for anyone who wants to end, of any age, who wants to end their life. You know, suicide is very different. That's why using that word for this bill is really a misnomer. It's not correct. It doesn't really help you understand it. Suicide is someone who is living, who gets depressed, who kills themselves. There's no, uh, there's really no other way to explain it. This is for someone who has been diagnosed by two physicians as being terminally ill and going to die within six months of time. It's, it's, it's been attested to by two physicians qualified, qualified to make that determination. If the person doesn't have capacity, and there's any sign of mental illness, which we know is true for suicides, then they cannot get the medication. And as far as being simply disabled, the bill actually has a provision in it that says, no person shall qualify for medical aid in dying under this article solely because of age or disability. So you must be terminally ill, you must have been diagnosed as such, and to equate suicide with someone who is going to die from natural causes because of a disease that we don't have a cure for is, is really unfair uh, to the person going through and, and unfair to the family members who are living through that. The, uh, all of us, I'm sure, at one point or another have driven across a bridge here, particularly the Tappan Zee Bridge, and we probably sat there for quite a while. Uh, and we see the signs, life is worth living with a telephone number, a hotline, for people to call. Our government spends millions of dollars trying to prevent suicides, people taking their lives, people who feel hopeless. Uh, we work in all the schools to convince people to do that. Uh, if I were to walk into the nearest hospital here and walk into the emergency room and say, you know, I'm thinking about, uh, I, I have a terminal illness, I'm thinking about ending things. They'll, they'll involuntarily commit me under Article 9 of the Mental Hygiene Law. I'll be examined for 48 hours by doctors, psychiatrists, social workers, nurses. If I'm still feeling like checking out, they can involuntarily commit me for up to 60 days, where I will be examined by more doctors.
workers, more psychiatrists, more social workers, lawyers will be involved, judges will be involved. How can we say that when I walk into the emergency room, we're going to fight like crazy to save my life? But if I'm upstairs and I get the diagnosis, here's your pills, go home. Maybe you'll use them, maybe you won't. Have a nice life. It's just kind of a great, great point of this issue, and that's the issue of, of general suicide. Um, suicide, this was just released over this, this weekend, that there, since 1999, there has been a 24% increase between 99 and 2014 of general suicide rates in this country. That's alarming. Amongst veterans, it's a huge problem. Amongst teenagers, it's a huge problem. Well, there's something else here that, that shows part of this problem and the effects that this type of legislation can have. In October of 2015, there was an article released by the Southern Medical Journal that showed when they controlled for other states and other factors, socioeconomic factors, etc., there was a 6% increase in the states where assisted suicide is legal. 6% increase. Each year in the state of Oregon, you see assisted suicide rates going up. Not going down, not staying level, going up. This is part of the, the suicide contagion. When you change the social norm, when you say this is the only option you have, this is the best option for you to take, that is what happens. You change a fundamental social norm. And you cannot say that this bill is just for people that have that last two weeks of life left. Because if it was that, that's exactly what the bill would state. No, it says six months. That's what it states. So it is suicide. When you look at the definition of suicide, this is what it is. You can try and change the name as nice as you want. You can rebrand it as compassion and dignity and all these wonderful buzzwords. But this is the same thing we heard 10 years ago. It was the same thing we heard 20 years ago. They just changed the name. It's the same organization. It just changed the name. There's no difference here. Mr. Stark, we're going to take some questions from here because none of us, a lot of us can't get up there. Bring it over here. Let me we have cards, and what we're going to do with all the questions that we're not going to be able to get to because it's already our time is we're going to publish them. So we're going to do a running list of everyone's questions. Um, you know, a lot of them have the same issues, but are said in different ways, and I think it's important that everybody get a chance to see how what what people are thinking. But right now, Gary. Well, the, the library wants us to wrap up. We could. Uh, We'll take just a, a couple, if you, a couple from the audience, but they got to be brief, not statements. Questions? Yeah. But it's just it's just five or ten minutes is all we have, so they got it's got to be bang bang. No, I just I gotta get this out of my system because um, I lost my mother three weeks ago from a Lewy body disease. And for those who know Lewy body disease, it's the second most common form of dementia, but it comes with Parkinson's symptoms. So for twelve years. You know, she, we went through this, okay? Um, thank you, I thought my mouth was big enough, sorry. Um, and I appreciate you just taking this. Um, Assemblywoman, you know, we're, obviously, we're, gonna, we're on the, the opposite side of, the, of this question, but when you said that, we, that, the, that we're gonna trust the state, the state regulations, the state bill, when my mother was in, I'm not gonna name the last nursing home, the first one she was in was John Jagan by Little Sisters of the Poor. Phenomenal care. Then she went on a ventilator for the last year of her life. I'm not sure I should have taken her on that journey, but we did. And she died in Einstein three weeks ago after being there for three months. Um, a report came out while we were in this next nursing home about, from the New York State, I don't know who, where the report came from, that New York State Health Department is extremely slow in giving violations to nursing homes and sometimes takes years to do so. We saw things in that nursing home that would turn people's heads and yet the state passes them, they, they turn a blind eye. So to say that we're gonna trust something because it's in a bill of law, I, with all due respect, um, that's hogwash. The second thing, the, the second thing is that um, my mom, when she was in eyesight, she got great care, but we got pressure to let her go earlier. And I could just imagine if this bill became legal, how much more pressure we would have had in the suffering. And last but not least, it has to do with when when abortion became legal in this state, in the country, we were told that it was a woman's choice. Yet the Guttmacher Institute, which is the Planned Parenthood arm of research, and the Elliott Institute, 
They gave statistics that 30 to 60 percent of women felt pressured into this by significant others, and yet it's ignored. Now this is Planned Parenthood, people. Planned Parenthood. So I'm, I'm going to the other side. So that you know the abuse is going to happen. Thank you. Okay, one yeah, that was your question. Does anybody have a question that they're going to ask? I have a question. I have a question. I heard tonight about denying a right. However, if we're going to talk about creating an option, simple logic dictates that the burden of proof is on the proponents, not the opponents. It is not for them to argue that we shouldn't have this. It's for you, Assemblywoman, and your supporters to argue that we should have this. Where does this right come from? You talk about denying of this right. Where does this right come from to commit assisted suicide? Where does the obligation come from on the medical profession to honor this so-called right? This is, it is exactly the same, it's, a, it's another medical option, we're not saying it's a right, we're saying it's a medical option just like the current medical option of palliative care uh, which allows you to end your life in a different way. So it's simply another medical option and as I stated earlier, uh, no physician and no healthcare agency uh, is going to be forced to provide this. So there's New York State is not going to be allowed to force any healthcare pro professional to do this if they don't want to. It will be an option, it will be a choice on the part of the patient, and it will be a choice on the part of the doctor. And for those, you know, and I'm very sorry about your mom, um, uh, for those who have dementia or for those who are incapable of making a choice, it is not an option. It is only an option for those people who have the capacity to make a choice. Okay, we have a question. Okay, JJ wants to say something. Brief if you can. I'll be as brief as possible. Uh, the issue of choice, it's brought up. This, there is a misconception of choice in this legislation. It is not your individual choice. Your doctor is making the decision for you. Your insurance company is making the decision for you. You are not making that decision for you. And here's the second, here's the second point on this. So please listen. Please listen. Again, at the end of the day, when you look at issues of decision making, personal independence, autonomy. I've been a veteran. I went to Iraq. I fought for the idea of independence. Whether you agree with that or not. But at the end of the day, this isn't just one person's idea of their individual right. This affects other people. And we could all agree that we should have individual rights in this country. We should have the, the autonomy to make decisions for ourselves. But when my personal decision could end your life, or your life, or your son's life, then we have a problem. And that's the argument that our side has made, is that this bill is not appropriate in terms of regulation, the issue is not appropriate in terms of management. They have shown that it cannot be done effectively, and the current way that it's written is ineffective in terms of the long term to trust that the New York State government is going to be managing this legislation appropriately in the long term. It doesn't happen. Don't, don't you think, I know I think, I think that patients' right to privacy and patients' right to his own decision making is primary in this situation. I'm not talking about, I don't think that anyone has the right to force someone else to make a decision or not to allow someone else to make a decision. It is my right at the end of my life when I, when I, when I agree with the doctor that I'm terminally ill. I don't have to accept what a doctor's diagnosis that I'm terminally ill, just as you didn't have to accept the doctor's diagnosis that you were terminally ill. If I decide that they're right and that I'm terminally ill, I wouldn't have the right to make that decision for myself. And again, to JJ's point, this is an option. And my husband chose VSED to voluntarily stop eating and drinking. 
that was an option that currently is legal. And that affected other people, just the way this option is an option, and it will affect lots of other people. It is no different than any other option that is currently allowed in this country, including taking my own life right now if I wanted to. Okay, so this is an option that we should allow to expand the current options that are currently allowed under the law. Thank you. Uh, for JJ to make the statement that this is not about individual choice, he's simply, he is simply, he is simply, he is simply, it is simply untrue. In fact, if you look at the legislation, the patient has to make a request in writing. It's the patient who's making the decision. It is the patient's choice to take the medication. It's the patient's choice to do everything in terms of his or her uh, desire and in, in, in accordance with his or her wishes at the very end of his or her life. To say that this is not the patient's choice is simply untrue, JJ. And I don't know how you could possibly even make that statement given, given the way the law works and given the way it has worked in Oregon over 18 years where it's been extraordinarily successful and there, there are no groups in Oregon or anywhere else that are really trying to end that law because it has been so successful. In fact, it's been so successful that, the, that a, in, in Washington as well, that a, a major cancer center in Seattle has started a death dignity program allowing people to take medications in their facility. And what they have concluded is that it has worked really well for both patients and staff. Um, just that the last, uh, I think, uh, my colleague wants to make a quick comment on it as well. But so uh, you, you talk about this choice issue of, of having the ability to make a choice. We're in an interesting location to have this debate. Uh, probably one of the more wealthier communities. Uh, I don't see a lot of people of color here. So obviously it's, it's hitting a certain point of the argument against this. So everyone here who has good health care structures, who have the financial resources to go out and can get a second, third opinion like I did, for us, there might be that opportunity that we can fight our insurance company, fight our doctors, and make sure that we're getting the best medical care to make a choice. But when I go down the road to Mount Vernon, I guarantee you that they don't. That's right. Okay, we have to wrap it up, and we have already received a lot of really interesting questions written down. We are going to publish them on LOHUD and also in our print exchange. Um, so if you did fill out a card and just, just drop it off. Uh, again, there's obviously a lot of feelings about this in the room. Please, if you want to write a letter to the editor about this issue, we will publish as many as we can. Uh, try to keep it as short as possible. 250 words is usually our target. Include your name and for verification purposes only, your address and a daytime phone number, and email it to letters at lohud.com, letters, plural, at lohud.com. Again, we appreciate all of your feelings about this issue. It's a very passionate issue. This has been a great audience, but we are on the time.